Okay, so welcome to the seminar class today. And uh, we will actually have three exercise sheets and we'll start with uh, the only problem we left over from the first class. So it's here, it's problem number nine. Um, and the question is to construct a formula which is a uh, 3CNF, or more precisely, should depend on a parameter n, so it will be a series of formula of growing size, and for which the saturation process of the resolution method yields exponentially many clauses. So um, there was one, I think, of you who wanted to show something. Okay, please, and I will prepare my whiteboard for the zoomers. Okay, so the problem is posted here. You have construct a formula in 3CNF, uh, more precisely a series of formula growing in size, respect to a natural number n, for which the saturation process of the resolution method yields exponentially many clauses. Okay. So that is the idea. So the idea was as well. I would just rewrite what you're writing there. So you had variables x1, xn, y and z, right, as the variables. Mm -hmm. And then now are the clauses, right? So x1 or not y or z. Here is x2 or y or not z. Here is x3 or what not y or z and etc. Yep. So in general we have x 2i plus 2i minus 1 or not y or z and x 2i or, no, or y or not z, right? Mm -hmm. And also from this we will get like... So here we'll get x1 and x2? No, y, y or... Or x2, yes, so you will, okay, and here you will get x3 or x4, etc., right? Most of from 2 and 3 you get uh, x2 or x3. Uh, so yeah, x2 or x3. Yes, others uh, in, in some cases for example in two and four we get like uh, from two and four we get x2 or x4 uh, or uh, or y or not z but then it will kill each other with others uh, i don't know how do you get that from two and four uh, x2 x4 and then y y no no but there is no such resolution method that you so the resolution rule is as follows. We need to kill, yes. need to kill something. Yep. So, okay. like, so resolution is, let me recall, it's A or P and B or not P yields A or B. We need to kill something. Uh, so here we can't kill something. Yeah, we well, cannot kill. So it's, 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 it's not going to work. It's, you will get quadratic number of them probably here more at most, but uh, no, not more. Ah, then, then we just need to add somewhere not, not x2, yes? So, for example, yes, so inst not instead, with this we need to add, for example, uh, with this not x1 and not y, not z, uh, also or z not x1 or not y or z and for example if we uh, have it's like uh, n plus one yeah and then we put n plus one and uh, two we will have x not two yes two x not x one Oh, oh, it's not right. No, th this the idea. I, I think is clear, but the realization could be harder. The realization could be not that easy. 
moment. Yeah, just, just, just think a bit. And all others could also think, because it's an interesting question. Maybe we don't need like this one, because we can get it from like this and this. No, but you need a solution. So let's uh, let's think a bit, and if not, then I will uh, just show my solution. It's, it's, it's close to what you are suggesting, but... Yes, we need to delete one of or X2 or not X2, because then we get only one variable and it, it's all. So maybe we need to cut it. If we add like this, yeah, but well, it's it's all guessing on the spot. Let, let me just because we have limited time. The idea is quite close to being correct. I will show just the uh, what what I what solution I supposed to have. So the, what was the idea? The idea was that if we had say sp specific variables x one, x two, x n, these are the variables, and we want to how can we get exponential? So suppose this is the set of all such variables, we denote it by x, and we have a subset, let's call it b, which is some, I don't know, x i1, x i k, which is an arbitrary subset of x. If any such subset can be somehow generated, we have exponential blow up, because there's B is an element of the set of all subsets of X, and the size of this set is exponential, right? Exactly to power. And I will make the following uh, the following clauses. I will make uh, clauses uh, like. Um, I will add also other variables, y1, say, let's just do yn. And I will have the following clauses, say, yi, yj, or xi, or yj plus 1 negated. So here i, j are both from 1 to n, and they're independent. So we have how many clauses? We have n square, which is what we can call it m. It is the number of clauses, right? And now how can you resolve them? You can say take this one y1 or x i1 for y2 negation. Then you can take y2 or x a2 i2 for y3 negation and so on and so on. And then you will have y k. Uh, maybe this should be. Uh, yeah, it's okay. No, I think that I should be from zero. I should be from there. And uh, for J, you should have from one to n plus one. You need x one, x two, y n plus one here. And here will not n square, but I think here you will have also also something quadratic, not 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 exponential. So you will have. M, which is equal to, I don't know, N multiplied by M plus 1, so not so much. And these are called uh, independent. So here you have YK, you will see Y. YK or XI. K or Y, K plus 1 negation. And now we we'll start resolving. I will write it in green. So resolving these two, what it will give to you? It will give you y1 or x i1 or x i2 or y3 negation. Then resolving with the next one will give you y1 or x i1 or x i2 or x i3 or y4 negation and so on. And in the end you will get The 
following clause. And there are two to the n clauses of this form. Question. So, like the first two, we, uh, uh, how to say, we decrease, and then we take that one that we get. Yes, and the third one. Then uh, what we get on the first step plus the fourth one. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, this is only one uh, line of resolutions, right? So, we can generate all the clauses of this form. Maybe something else. We don't care about it. But all clauses of that form are generated. And there is an exponential number of them. So, well, you can say that um, you can also reformulate it in well, if M is more or less N square, well, it's N plus 1, forget about plus 1, Mr. just N square, then you will have that N is roughly speaking the square root of M, and you will have the 2 power N is 2 power the square root of M. So it's also an exponential blow up. It's a smaller exponential, but it's an exponential blow up. Why do you say in the beginning that if we find the subset B, then it will be included in the power set? No, but the subset of X is an element of the power set, right? So for any 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 B for any such subset, you have a clause and there is an exponential number of them. So this exponential non-determinism. You generate all of them. And by the way, this uh, uh, this CNF is trivially satisfiable, right? So you will never get a contradiction. But formally speaking, to apply a resolution, you have to generate all of this stuff. And this is what makes you exponential blow up. It's a, a stupid example. It's uh, something so satisfying here is trivial. You just make all x's true, and it's. But uh, the, the algorithm will get stuck generating all these, uh, all these clauses, because there are no isolated literals. Question. Uh, I think why this one is exponential number of clauses. Well, because you see, for any subset B, for any set of x's, you have a clause. And the number of sets is exponential. Ah, okay. It's like the number of subsets of a set. Of, of the, the set. Of a set, the number of subsets is the uh, two, two power, power n. Power yeah. n. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And also, only the, the, the only trick is that here is uh, the exponential in the number of variables, not in the number of clauses, because the number of clauses was quadratic and became exponential. But it's also exponential blow up. Because this two power square root is also exponential, so it's nothing. Nothing. Nothing happens here. You you can you can make it uh, some other examples, but the, the idea is actually the same. So how uh, it's the, the usual thing? How can you get something exponential? In in general, you usually take a set and all its subsets. All of the transpositions, which will give a factorial, which is also more than exponential. So, so, something like that. So, you have a set and you have all its substructures. This is the, say, the source of exponentiality, usually. This is, this is an example. It's not unique. There are many ways of constructing similar ones. Actually, you can, you, if these, uh, you can make all these y's actually the same y which will make the number of clauses less because you don't need to enumerate all of them. Uh, but this will make you stand strange clauses like why or not why. Formally, it's possible, but the easy optimization of resolution makes just removes them. Because why or not why is one, and then just such a clause is trivially true, and then you just immediately satisfy it and you remove the clause. 
But here they are formally different, so each clause is non-trivial, and each clause in the resolution is non-trivial, but uh, it's exponential law. Okay, any more questions on this point? You see, not, not, it's not so hard a problem, it's just preparing an example. Okay, then we shift to uh, first order logic, and let us see what we're what we have discussed and what we are going to discuss. If yeah, if someone in the classroom doesn't have the problem exercise sheet, then I will. Well, I have plenty of them actually here. Okay. Okay. So um, from the first problem, I think we'll not discuss all of them. But what do you wish to discuss? I, I, did we do C or do you want to discuss C? Uh, yes, we did see, and what I think we, we are not wishing to discuss all these problems, right? By now, what of them do you want to discuss? Okay, do you want to discuss D? Let's discuss D. So. It's a Boolean logic, it's no, a Boolean logic, sorry, it's uh, predicate logic, it's uh, logic of first order predicates. So it's uh, one point D, it's for all X exists Y such that R of X, Y, then there exists Y for all X, R of X, Y. How do you think? Is it generally true in any model, in any interpretation? Yeah, if we take um, a lot, we get the same uh, with the renames of. Uh, Do you want to replace it with uh, not A? A implies B with not A or B? Or and we get like X is X, that is for all Y, uh, not Rx, or. The same with the renamed. Okay, so we write like this. So exists x for all y not r of x y. This is the negation of the premise, and the conclusion is the same. And does this help us? The quantifiers are in different order here. Now, let's just try to understand. Should this be true? Why? Satisfies all, yeah. So, so the first one, so we don't actually need this. It's uh, we can do it with implication also. So uh, the first one says that the e for h x, there exists some y, which is in the relation with x, right? So if we take some other x, x prime, then the relation could yield lead to another y prime. And here there should exist some global Y, which is good for all X's. Including itself, by the way. So the standard counterexample could be as follows. So, for example, consider as our support set, we consider just integers. And R is inequality. Then you can say that for all x there exists y such that x is less or equal than y. This is of course true. We can take x plus 1 for example, or x itself. But uh, for all there exists y such that for all x, x less or equal than y would mean that y is the maximal element, right? Is greater or equal than anything. And this is false. Uh, 
Uh, yes, it will hold because just the conclusion holds. So the, the conclusion holds everywhere where there is a maximal element. Uh, so it's uh, the, the conclusion says that there is so there are two properties. If R, well, if R is an order, it's, it could not be an order. It could be something else. It could be an arbitrary relation. But if if it is a linear order, or a free order, partial order, then uh, the first, the second, the, the conclusion says that there is a maximal element, the element which is greater than anything else. And uh, the first says that there is uh, so for each there is a next one. No, but the question was whether this this is generally true for any interpretation. So for any relation. And for any, yeah. We'll show the counter example. Okay. This is a counter example. So, and let, let's also do why one E, it's an interesting example. Mm, one E, question in the in, in Teams also. Uh, sorry, can you please, yep, it's, it's, it's there, I shared it already. It's so, old activity, what's the activity? Can you repeat why it is not general true? Um, well, something is generally true uh, if it uh, is true for any interpretation of our R, of our symbols. And I presented an interpretation where it is false, because the left-hand side is true and the right-hand side is false. One counterexample makes the thing not generally true. Okay, and now we move to 1E. E. How do you think? Is this formula true? Uh, sorry, if we can uh, make the equivalence for implication, we get that it is X that we don't have any relation. We have just some. Uh, yes, so we're going to write it like this. Or we have for Y, we have so if Y is. One, one element set. No, you would make a count example. Okay, I have one element set, and uh, here, but this is the disjunction. So if this, if d of x zero is true, uh, then you will have the, f the false, and you have the first one. Yes, yes. Well, that question is whether it's generally true. Yes, for all y, d of y. Again. But actually, uh, you can look at the one of the, uh, I think it's not here, but you see that there is this uh, thing that exists x, for phi of x or psi of x is the same as exists x phi of x or exists x psi of x, right? It isn't the same x. It could, it could be the same, it could be not the same. You see that, uh, oh, it's, it's bound variable. So you see here, what is what is the case? I claim that this is equivalent to the following. The second, so here you have a disjunction, and the second half of the disjunction does not depend on x, right? For all y, d of y. 
then you can take it away from the quantifier. That's a first call. Or the second. So you see, we have the first line. We replaced uh, implication with negation and disjunction. Yeah, it's okay. But why we, why, why we did that? So, okay, the second disjunct for all y, d of y does not depend on x. And we can take it away from the quantifier. Well, when is the first part? Because the first one depends on x. It's under the quantifier. You cannot remove it. It's, it's x. Oh, okay. so, so how can this be satisfied? If the second thing is satisfied for all y, d of y, then the formula is satisfied. We don't need to find an x because any x would suffice. It does not depend on x. So we just need some function that, ah, no. Okay. No, the, the, the second and the third lines are equivalent. Is that clear? This is the question. But now we can do the following. It's a tautology. I'm going to rename y to x, and they will just p or not p. So these tricks, they make this formula to generally valid. Uh, this formula uh, is sometimes called what they call drinker formula. Like then everyone drinks. So it says, I suppose we have a non-empty bar. Then this formula says the following, that it's such a bar that exists a person that if that person drinks, then anyone drinks. D is for drinking. It's uh, a strange, say, so this is one of these paradoxes of classical implication, classical quantification. Because people, when they are talking about uh, if, if then, they usually mean something like causation. They mean something like that if then is... Uh, uh, that the premise somehow causes the conclusion. And then this is not generally, all, no, not is considered to be generally true because this makes that that guy should somehow motivate other people to drink. But uh, uh, really, it's all no material implication. And it's done by case analysis, as we do here. So we we'll go into the bar and see, okay, if everyone drinks, then it's true because uh, or everyone drinks, and the, any, any person will suffice. You take anyone, okay, you drink, and anyone drinks. Then the implication is true. But if there is some sober guy who does not drink, then it's also validated, because if he drank, then anyone else would also drink, but he doesn't drink. And so, therefore, it's true by falsity of the, of the premise. So it's it's one of these places where informal, say, classical logic uh, goes into some sort of paradoxical thing. I could show one more, even in even propositional logic. So the paradox of material implication. So I can say something like this: that um, L implies E, and P implies F. No. Yes, P implies F, then L implies F, or P implies E. Is that true? Well, uh, probably yes, by just zeros and ones, right? So suppose that if, say, E or F is one, then the conclusion is one, right? Because it's disjunction. If both E and F are false, zero, then also L and P should be false. And then L implies F and P implies E, because zero implies zero, right? So this formula is true. It's a tautology. L, E, and P, F are just propositional variables. And now let's give them some of the following meanings. So L means that, say, John is in London. E means that John is in England. P 
B means that John is in Paris, and F means that John is in France. So now the uh, premises are true. If I'm in, in London, I'm in England. If I'm in Paris, and I'm in France. But what the conclusion says, if I'm in London, then I'm in France, or if I'm in Paris, then I'm in England. Both of them are, of course, false, and therefore the conclusion is false. So it, it, it fails. In, in the natural understanding, it, it fails. And uh, why is it so? Well, because uh, we do not take care of, say, what they call possible worlds, of uh, other possibilities. So there is only one John, and in, in, he is either in England or in France. And therefore, just one of these, or he's either in London or in Paris, or, or maybe nowhere, maybe somewhere else, I don't know, in Moscow. And uh, then one of these premises is just always false. And this makes it fail. So, uh, in natural language, when we say if then, we consider not only the current state of the world, but any possible state. So, uh, say in time. So, a person travels along the world, and these implications should hold on during his all of his trip. Not only say. So when he moves to I don't know to Paris, then immediately the second part of the conclusion starts failing because he's in Paris but not in England. So we can like transform our natural language to uh, uh, Boolean formula. Yes, but Boolean logic is not adequate for describing what we mean by implication. Because the left-hand side, what we mean by these implications, they're generally true, they're true in all possible situations. For all variants for John. And the, on the right-hand side, this is made true just artificially because we fix the position where John is and just we have zero, zero for the other one. So if he is in London, and he's not in Paris, for example, or he, but he's in England. So it's, but if we allow him to travel, then each of these implications will start failing at some point. And uh, then this is... Yeah, but this is just an example that... Uh, why, why I did uh, it's actually in a sense against the, the uh, course itself. Because um, when we are um, discussing... Uh, the one discussing Boolean logic, and the motto was that in Boolean logic you can express many good things like graph colorings and then you reduce everything to SAT and that is a hard problem and, that, and P and so on and so forth. This example shows that some sorts of reasoning which are quite natural for us, they are not expressible in, uh, in propositional, propositional Boolean logic. Even though everything is propositional here. So we have to go to all the no classical logics and stuff like that. Or maybe this could be resolved by uh, adding uh, adding some parameters. Say we can say for all j, if L of j, then E of j, or j is for John, for any possible John. And then with the, if you take rewrite this formula as for any possible value of John, if he is in London, then he is in England. This is true. And the same for any possible. Again, I is J, but it could be another person. P of which Jean. And then phi F of J. This is true. But if we write down the left hand side, it's going to be for all again J. L of J implies f of j or for all j p of j implies e of j this is in in real world this is not true because both of them can be falsified but on different people so we take john who is in london but he definitely is not in france and falsify the first one we take jean who is in paris but of course not in england and falsify the second one so this is how we re re reduce it. So it's 
Boolean logic is insufficient for them to say that. Even though there we managed to make all these guys in a Boolean form, but the real formula is not this one, but it's this a quantified one. So this is how it works. Okay, this was just a detour to some not classical logical things. Okay, let's go forward and let me take a look again at the, the yep, this one. Okay, so do you want to do something from two? It's dual, it's satisfiability. I think it's easy. If you wish something, we'll, we'll show. If not, then. So you want C? Okay, that's 2C. Do 2C, two, two okay. Exists X for all Y is satisfiable, yes. Q of X and Y implies for all Z are X, Y, Z. And the question is whether this formula is satisfiable. Much an easy question, by the way. I have a trivial solution. No, no, well, the question is whether it's satisfiable, not whether it's generally true. We want to be positive, we want to be satisfied. If you try to find an example, we want to satisfy it. How to satisfy implications is the easiest way. No, no, false. Yes, false. I mean, zero, yeah. So the, in the easiest way to make this true is just to make this false. But it's just, but you can say it. You can make that Q always false, and that's it. Because the, con the conclusion does not depend on Q anyway. It's only about R. And then make the conclusion false. Or you can make R always true, for example. So many ways to satisfy it. It's an easy, easy exercise. Okay, got it. Yeah, they got good. Um, should we give an example of such Q? Uh, yes, you can take any set and take Q, which is just always false. Well, it's, it's a concrete example. And right? what is like the real world interpretation for such Q, which is always false? Is it like a, we can Am empty a relation? Just an empty relation. Oh. Just uh, or R so. Uh, you can make a non-trivial example saying that the for all z are of x y z you can find uh well again you can find a ternary relation which is always true yeah by the way these, these are the only so for all x there exists x such that for all y you may say that okay you may make something that's trivial you may say something like that okay i have I take a specific x0, and I take that for all y, not q of x0 and y, right? Okay. It's sufficient, because you should not make it always false. It's sufficient to make it false for at least one x, right? You take an x and you... And suppose you take, I don't know, natural numbers. What? No, pi is not a natural number. But you can take x0 just being 0. And q of xy being that x is strictly greater than y. Then there is no number which is strictly less than zero, so there is no number such that zero is strictly greater than it. And therefore, if you take zero as this x, then this guy will be always false, and that satisfies you. But this is a non-trivial example. 
Uh, my question was like, can we make like some uh, sets like uh, natural numbers and something not from natural numbers? Yes, of course. Of course, it's absolutely arbitrary. So, so maybe the thing which you should, uh, from these formal exercises, the thing you should understand is that in logic you have much more freedom than, say, in algebra. When you are talking about these interpretations, so what, what you have? You have some uh, support set, M, the domain, and you have some operations. Here you have predicates, sometimes you also have functional symbols like plus, something like that. In usual math, you are usually restricted to something uh, being sort of natural. So in the sense that if you have a relation, it should be, I don't know, a good partial order or something like that. If there is an operation, it should be something like good algebraic operation, like associative, I don't know, distributive, or with respect to some other operation, etc. But this naturality is very, very hard to formalize. What is more natural than another one? And so here we're absolutely free. We can take an arbitrary set, and an, but it should be non-empty. Domain should be non-empty. Otherwise, say the drinker formula will fail, because it starts with an existential quantifier. If a domain is empty, you couldn't satisfy it anyway. So it should be non-empty. It is there is a variant of first order logic with possibly empty domains. It's a specific thing. We're not discussing that. And uh, it can be finite. It could be infinite. The objects there could be arbitrary, absolutely arbitrary. You could take I don't know natural numbers. Add as you said pi. You can add to natural numbers anything infinity. I don't know. But it's all some symbols. You can add just an extra element with specific properties. You can define operations in a crazy way on it. And it will not satisfy any laws and stuff like that. People could say, but why should in the world we discuss that? Because there's are strange models. But the answer is as follows. In logic, everything is bureaucratized. If you wish your operations to obey certain laws, certain principles, well, then that's just you should explicitly state these principles as first order formulae and uh, ask them for, to be true. And then you will, so this is, by the way, question five. So. You have a relation which is arbitrary and you want it to be, I don't know, a partial order. Then you have specific formula which you can write down and the, for, the formula will make it so. It can be made linear order, it can be made, say, partial order and for operations also. You can make your rules, say, associative, activity, also write them down as first order, say, formula. We don't have functional symbols, but, but we can express them as in predicates. So, for example, if you want to write in algebra, you can write, I don't know, x plus y equals z. Then here you can just have a ternary predicate symbol which says like this, which expresses the same. And this is just a more convenient way in logic, just to, to reduce language. Plus, or multiplication also, stuff like that. Okay, so uh, problem two is finished for problem three i believe we did it last time right uh no we... in the lecture i think no if not then we'll uh, we did problem four definitely yeah. for problem three we actually did it i made it as an example but let's look at it once more if it's so th this is a formula i will show it also here on the screen uh, problem number three this is a formula which can be f validated only on uh, infinite m so this makes our logic, well, it has binary predicates. With unary predicates, this is impossible. Right? But uh, this makes our logic essentially infinite in them. Is model. Dan doesn't have finite model property. So if for propositional logic we had finite models, well, they could be, they could be exponential enumeration of them, but there is only finite them. Here, this requires the model to be infinite. So, okay, it's, it may look scary, but what does it, it, it say? What does the second part say about the second conjunct? For all x, for all y, for all z. What does it say about q? Not, not in the relation itself. So it's irreflexive. And it's... And the transitive, yeah. So the first one says it's irreflexive, the second one says it's transitive. So we have an irreflexive transitive relation 
And we know that for all x there exists a next element. So it says the following. So uh, the formula says that, so it's problem number three. The, it says that Q irreflexive, Q transitive, and for all x exists y, Q of x, y. It means that if you have an x, then you have a y which it sees. Why such a structure should be infinite? Well, because if you take that it's an empty, so you can take some x0, then it should see some x1, and x1 is not the same as x0 because it's ir irreflexive. Next, this should see some x2, and x2 is not x1 and also not x0 due to irreflexivity and transitivity. And so on. For the infinite chain of elements generated by this principle. So this says that there is an infinite chain, and these guarantee that this chain is it does not collapse. So they're not no non uh, all different, right? Like the, the third one. The third, well, okay, let's let's make it like this. So you have x i, you have x j, where j is greater than i, strictly greater. This means that here there is a chain of q's, right? Then there means that there is this q due to transitivity. But this means that there is q of x i, x j. And this means that xi is not the same as xj, because otherwise we violate irreflexivity. Oh, this is a part of our long line. So. Yeah, but we just say that for all x, we have some. Why is it exists a relation between them? Yes. But then we take any element, an arbitrary one, x0. We take y. If this is x1. Yes. For x1, there also exists such an element. We take it as x2. Yes, but why, for example, for x2, it isn't like the element x0? Okay, suppose it's x0. So it is x0. Then this is x1. Suppose it's backwards. Okay. By transitivity, you have this. Uh, yes. Yes, and it's irreflexive. And yes. yes. So. so, it's the model should be infinite, but the formula is satisfiable. So we can take, for example, natural numbers, and for Q we can take less. It's transitive, it's irreflexive, and for any x there is a bigger element. So this is an example. So, a question on teams, okay? How do we understand that Q is irreflexive and transitive? Well, let's just write this down. So uh, it says that for all x, not Q, x, x. This is irreflexivity. And uh, in our, and here we have it explicitly. It's postulated in our formula. And the same for transitivity. So transitivity says that for all x, y, z, uh, if Q of X, Y and Q of Y, Z, then uh, Q of X, Z. And here it's basically the same. It's just written with two implications instead of an implication from a conjunction. It's equivalent to the same. Yep. It's all about the question by Mr. Rodenkov about how do we understand that Q is irreflexive and transitive. OK. 
Okay. So, and uh, next we see that we have already done problem number four last time. For problem number five, I think that it's no need to uh, discuss it here because with reflex tendency, we already did it, symmetric and symmetric also you can do it. Um, and finally, problem number six. Who wants to show problem number six? Uh, I did it you don't want? No. Okay, anyone else? Show problem number six. No? Well, maybe let's call you that. If you find a good mark, it will be nice. Okay, we will rewrite it on my journal here also. So problem number six. It's uh, we have the following formula for all x r of x x, so it is reflexive, and for all x for all y for all z, you will have if r of x z then r of x, y, or r of y, z. Then these two imply that there exists such u that for all v, r of u, v. So there is a point which sees all other points. I did it from like uh, inverse, so I said, okay, let's uh, it be false for. Uh, yeah, the 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 uh, domain here is A B C. The only three elements. Yes. So All different, but they only three. Uh, false. So uh, the only way it's false is if one goes to zero. So uh, false. We have false that you. Mm -hmm. So this is true, if the premise it should be true, yeah. and the conclusion should be false. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the left side is a uh, contraction, so we need to have like two parts of true. So true will have, first is uh, reflexivity, uh, or relax. R X X and uh, we need to have that R X R Y R E Do you have any other marker? No, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. We need to find another one. No one. No, but we see it on the on the screen, so we can you know not it or write uh, it. Okay, uh, so um, we, we we can re rewrite it, and we have like uh, the not f x x. Yeah, but you just take z equals x, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then we get not uh, x uh, 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 x and uh, r x s. And then not r x x and r x y and r y z. Uh, no, where, where do we need a priority? I think we might put all the brackets. No, uh, conjunction is, is, is stronger. It's strong conjunction, you show something. So you see what is the idea? If you have Rxx and you have it, you're going to do the resolution now, but even easier. If you have Rxx, then you will have Rxy or Ryx just by taking z. So here you take z equals x. And taking this and having this as true, you will have R of xy or R of yx 
which is true for all x's and y's. This should be true. This should hold, right? So and I'll draw some picture here. So for any of them, you should have something like that. And then we get that this is right. Yeah, and then you get that the result is right. Why? Why? Why should it be right? Uh, so uh, it's because um, so this is to skew each other, and also we have this. So we have like or this or this, and then we can check it by its finite. So no, yeah, the, the check is like that actually. So you have for any two objects are have one connection, or y x or x y. And the only possible problematic case is when they form a loop. Because say if they are like that, and they go both into one. Oh, then, oh, oh no, it's not, not, I, I didn't want to do this, I wanted to do this. So suppose we have one which sees both. Then we are right, we have the, we are, the conclusion is true, right? If we have a point which sees both of them, right? But the only problematic case is when uh, is when you have this. Now look, what can happen then? If they're not a loop, then there is a point which both go on. Here, it will kill because of uh, this. We have Rx X and uh, Rx one. Or, 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 so, and this is true. Now this is true, yes. So no, yeah. no, we already we are already in this stage. So we need know that this is true. That for any two x and y, we have either x y or y x. We we know how to prove it. Suppose we know. You already proved it. Yes, but uh, and then. But then uh, the only problematic case is drawn there. Look at the 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 the, the, the project projector. Yes, I understand. We have the loop, but uh, so we need to show that this is this will be true. Yes, yes. We show that this will be true. This is correct. Yes. No, no, but in the in the, in this in this case where a so what we know that for a two we have an arrow at least in one direction, right? Yes. But suppose that a sees c, c sees b, and b sees a. So we need to show that it there exists one that sees all of them. By now we don't see it, but there will be another arrow. We need to apply this uh, once more. Uh, one moment. Uh, we show this, and then we get that we have uh, a loop, a loop, and uh, zero to one case. Yes. So we need to show that this is also true, because uh, as I understand, as I think, as I thought, that we need some contradiction. No, it's not, it's not okay. You try to do it by contradiction, but it's uh, it's not needed. We need just to show the result. That this, this should be true. The, 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 the red one, the conclusion. Okay. How to show that this is true? We know, we know that the green formula are true, right? Mm -hmm. This means that for any two elements, there is at least one arrow. We have only three elements, so we get four, two, two, two. Okay. We know that we have some arrow for uh, one of the elements or for uh, a different for, one. Yeah. An interesting. To, to itself. So we always have a path. So no, no, but they say that there exists a y that for all v is not for all v exists a y. Exists u for all v. So there should be an element 
which has errors to all elements. Yeah. And this is the only problematic case where they see each other by, like this. Okay. But now we, we have to apply this formula once more. So suppose we know that R of AC, this is true, right? Yeah. Then we get R of AB or R of BC. Because here A equals X, B equals Y, and C equals Z. Yeah, and what does it mean? It means that either we have, I will write it in another color. So either we have, so we take this, and either we have from A to B, so either we have this, or we have this. And in both cases, so in this is the first case, this is the second case. In the first case, we take u equals a, and it sees both b and c and itself, right? And in the second case, we take u equals b. This finishes our problem. Uh, need to think about it a bit, right? Uh, sorry, so we have this to... Uh... Yeah, so we have a... So, okay, let's, yeah, let's, let's think about this once more. So, um, <laughs> we have these two green formulae on the top. These formulae are true, right? What does this mean? It means that each point sees itself, right? Okay, so I, I was talking about seeing, it means that R of X, Y. From each point, there's an arrow to itself. And uh, this is this strange condition. And let's take Z equals X here. What will it yield us? It will yield R of X, Y or R of Y, X. Provided R of X, X, but R of X, X is true. So this means that to, for any two points, there is at least one arrow, either from X to Y or from Y to X. And now we need to show that there is a point for which there is an arrow to anyone. And if uh, so, and now we have these three points. So we have, say, A, B, C. They see, of course, each one sees itself. And we know that there is an arrow. And suppose, okay, without loss of generality, we can say that there is an arrow from A to C, right? If there is an arrow also from A to B, we're done, right? because we have this A, which is U. Now, that, therefore, the arrow should go like that. Again, if there is an arrow from B to C, we are done. So we'll draw an arrow from C to B. Now we are in this situation, right? And we apply, the, again, this premise, but to A equals X, B equals Y, C equals Z. We know that there is AC, therefore, it should be AB or BC. But when we look here, there is so there's a b a already here, but we take at a b, and then a becomes the desired u because it sees b and sees c and sees itself, right? Second case, if b c, then b becomes the needed u because b to a, b to c, and b to b. Okay, so we're we're finished at that. Now uh, I think the class is uh, four minutes left. So we have a new exercise sheet. I will uh, give the, um, the sheet itself to you. Yep, so this is pretty distributed. And uh, for the people on Teams, I will um, just post the, again, the reference. Um, So if this should be the correct one. Yeah, this is the new problem sheet. It's more of a theoretical one. It requires you to uh, recall what we did in today's lecture. Unfortunately, well, we have only three minutes left, so I think it's meaningless to start solving something from that. So I suggest you to so try to start solving it at home. And uh, if any questions, you can uh, contact me by email or write me on Teams. I'm sometimes there. And... Uh, uh, 
this is one thing and the other thing I will remind you that there is the home assignment which is due by October 19 and the deadline is strict so um, if you lose the deadline there will be some penalties and stuff like that so please don't do this and everything is on the github uh, classroom so when you uh, this is the new invite link for the new installation of the course when you click on the invite link user login on github if not you have to create as your login and uh, then it uh, clones the repository with this readme file and there you should create the file called boolean.py and then using the readme you should in this file you should provide two functions each of which does the one part of the job and the automatic grading system will uh if you have it done correctly the automatic grading system will give you a green mark which says that you are correct if not then it's failure and in the case of failure is you could still uh, or get some credit for that if you uh, do the first half of the assignment you will get two points out of four so uh there is a fallback solution to submit via email this is the address this is my standard address at the university domain uh if uh, this is the only way if you don't use python 3 if you use python 2 or if you use another language than python you will only way to submit it to submit to you by email because the grading system will not grade it properly um again if any questions please ask and also there is this which i didn't talk about last time it's the identification form uh on uh, google uh you if your nick on github is not say easily mutually understandable with your say name surname then just please identify yourself here just in order for me to understand what are these people there well and there are some questions on teams um see more if we have an element uh one d we have the element x is comparable with other y then maximal element is exist why the second line is false ah uh, i'll go back to 1d so um for all x no there is no maximal here it's z so in z there is no maximal and therefore that there is no uh, maximal element but the, for each element there is an element which is greater or equal than it. this is the answer to the first question and one e how we move not to the left on the first uh here yes yeah, there is a specific uh law that exists x not 5x is equivalent to f not for all x 5x so if there exists an x which which phi is not true then it's definitely not true then that for all x phi is true i hope i ask, answered these questions correctly and we're just in the end of the class so thank you for coming both physically and virtually and we reconvene in a week thank you and goodbye